sensation and perception go hand in hand. But what exactly is the difference between sensation and perception? When does one end and the other begin? In this video, we will go over what sensation and perception are, how they differ, and what influences what we perceive. We could think of sensation as hearing a buzzing sound and perception as recognizing it as a bee. Or as seeing a furry black mass versus recognizing it as a dog. More specifically, sensation is the reception of stimulation from the environment or from within the body and the initial encoding of that stimulation into the nervous system. In other words, sensation is our direct physical contact with the world. Perception, on the other hand, is the process of interpreting and understanding sensory information. It involves forming meaningful experience from sensory stimulation. In reality, sensation to perception is a fluid, multi-step process, so it's not truly possible to say when sensation stops and perception begins. In fact, some have argued that the whole process should be simplified as the perceptual process and to not bother with the term sensation. However, sensation does represent a very critical step of that perceptual process, and that is the step of transduction. Transduction is when stimulation from the environment is converted into a neural impulse. For the sense of vision, transduction is when light stimulation reaches the receptor cells in the back of the eye and the absorption of light by those photoreceptive cells causes them to send an electrical impulse to the rest of the brain. From that point on, it is difficult to distinguish when sensation ends and perception begins. Interestingly, perception doesn't just depend on incoming sensory stimulation. It also draws from memory and strongly depends on what we already know about. Take this image for example. Do you see the Dalmatian? Initially it is tricky to find. It is right here, with its head on the left sniffing the ground in front of it. Once you are able to see the Dalmatian, you really can't unsee it. You may even be able to see a shadowy area in the upper left-hand corner that looks like it could be beneath a tree's canopy, possibly. So this is an example where what we know about Dalmatians and what dogs look like when they walk and sniff the ground, how that influences what we see, what we perceive. The sensation from the black and white areas of this image alone isn't enough for us to perceive the dog. We also need to draw from what we already know and have experienced in the past. That drives what we expect to see in this image, which in turn drives what we perceive. So sensation is a driver of perception, but so is what we already know, what we have stored in memory. This relationship is similar to one you may have heard between top-down and bottom-up processing. Bottom-up processing begins with relatively raw, unprocessed sensory information and builds towards more conceptual representations of that information. For example, when recognizing the bee, you might have started by noticing its colors and wings and legs dangling down and eventually putting everything together to form the visual image of a bee. That is an example of bottom-up processing. Top-down processing is when conceptual knowledge, what we already know, what we have in memory, influences the processing and interpretation of lower-level perceptual processes. We saw that with the Dalmatian image. Once we recognized the dog, we were able to interpret the otherwise random-looking black and white areas. So while we can distinguish these two types of processing, in reality, everything we perceive makes use of both top-down and bottom-up processing. As sensory information is coming in, our brains are making predictions of what it might be based on what it already knows. Most of the time, the brain gets it right. 
but sometimes it can be quite wrong. Let me give you an example of something that happened to me. Once I was at home in my kitchen and I opened up the lid to the garbage can. Immediately, when I looked down into the can, I saw little maggots squirming around all over the trash. After a moment of staring into the can in disbelief, I started to realize that rather than maggots, what I was looking at were grains of rice that I had tossed earlier. It's interesting, however, that what my brain saw was maggots, not rice. They were even wiggling. It goes to show that top-down processing can have a very powerful influence on what we perceive. What this example also shows us is how much interpretation actually goes on in the brain. Even when the brain gets it right, much of what we perceive hasn't necessarily been sensed. For example, people generally approach the world as though it is perceived exactly how it is. This idea is referred to as naive realism. However, we know, for example, that the edges that we see in the world are enhancements by the cells in the eye and the brain. We don't see those edges how they are, but rather how our brain has enhanced them. Also, information about color in the world is made up of how that light travels. If the light wave travels in short, tight waves, then we perceive it to be purple. However, if the light wave travels in longer, looser waves, we perceive it to be red. In fact, without light, objects would have no color. Finally, consider that some other animals and insects are able to detect sensory stimuli that humans don't have access to. Take flowers, for example. Some birds and insects are able to see levels of ultraviolet light that humans can't see. And for that reason, humans miss out on much of the visual display some flowers put on for their pollinators. So hopefully that helps to clarify what sensation and perception are, how they differ, and what influences what we perceive. Now that this video is over, consider briefly writing down from memory what you have learned. This sort of practice retrieving from memory is one of the best things you can do to remember what you just learned.